<laughs> um, so, so I'll list some, some, some of the Millennium problems. So, so this was a collection of seven open problems given by the Clay Institute in the 2000s meant to foster uh, ideas and ways of thought in certain directions of math. Uh, they're worth a million dollars each if you solve one. Uh, so I guess if I convert myself, that, that, that's 70 million rupees each. Uh, and so we'll, we'll introduce at least two of those, I, I think, as we're going through today and get some vague idea of what's being asked uh, about them, depending on how time allows. Uh, I should probably point out that, that I will do my best, but you know, talking math, as I'm sure most of you know, is a little bit like talking another language. And it, it, you know, explaining these things is not unlike me standing up here when you talk about Kafka, but insisting that we look at the original German up here. It's slightly challenging. I'm going to do my best to translate into English for us, and that's going to be our goal, right? But, but you know, one can kind of do what we can in this regard. Oh, thanks. Thank you. So, so let me start by outlining the talk. Um, so the, the, the first thing we're going to stop is to look at sizes and types of infinity. So yes, indeed, there is more than one type of infinity and, and that exists out there. Um, <clears throat> uh, and so unsurprisingly, uh, this involves a good deal of, of subtlety to actually understand. Uh, after we sort of, you know, notions of infinity here are going to be our entryway into singularities. So, so what mathematicians do uh, um, is we study equations. These equations are meant to model a variety of things. Some of them are physical and some of them aren't. So, so everything from water waves and how stuff moves around uh, to heat flow, so how the temperature in this room is moving out. And you should expect it to be a little colder, you know, common sense stuff in this case. Cold near the air conditioning, a little bit warmer in and how it moves as you turn the temperature on and off, but hopefully more complicated things as we move along in life. Um, and more complicated things like, like, like particle interactions and differential invariance, just to use a big word for the fun of it. Um, as it turns out, these solutions aren't numbers, right? right? They're, they're, they're functions, like, like the temperature in the room, right? So at every point in the room, it's a number, it's what the temperature is there, and it's different everywhere, right? So solutions are functions. They also might be geometries or shapes, and we'll kind of get a couple examples of those as we're going along. And at least in most interesting cases, they are not nice. They're singular, that they have bad behaviors associated to them. And as these singularities are actually usually the most interesting um, that uh, want to understand, they're also the things that you have to understand usually to apply these things in practice as you're moving along. And the next thing we'll talk about are some of the open problems that, that, that are related to these singularities. And then I, I will want to hopefully try to introduce you to at least one type of singularity. All right, that's going to be my goal. I, I'm going to have one math page here. That, 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 that's what I'm going to you know, inflict upon you because the door's over there. Um, <laughs> but we're going to try to keep it limited to this. And, and then finally, we'll actually maybe, if we have some time, uh, uh, discuss some of what these open problems are and have some words on them. Okay. So, um, to discuss singularities, uh, let me first talk about infinity. So, so there was... Uh, observation by, by Cantor in, in the mid-1800s, uh, which was that not all infinities are actually equal. Um, some are bigger than others. And, and you're, you're not alone in thinking this is crazy, <coughs> if you haven't heard this before. Uh, so, so, you know, it's, it's basically standard now, that this sort of idea and this thought. Um, at the time, it was extremely controversial. Oh, you go back. <coughs> so, so at, at the time, it was very controversial. So, so, I mean, as you know, tends to happen during that time period, uh, people even started to think this was somehow uh, uh, against religion that, that was coming out. People became quite fanatical uh, about this idea. Cantor was referred to as a corrupter of youth, among other things, for, for, for coming up with this idea. And mind you, when I say he was referred to as a corrupter of youth, I, I don't mean by, by religious zealots, which would somehow maybe be more understandable. These were academics, like, like respected academics who, who were making these statements at the time. So, so people were unhappy with this idea. Uh, um, at least in part to the, this general reaction, Cantor was kind of an unstable fellow who spent most of his life in and out of asylums. So, so let, let me give you his example, <coughs> not necessarily a proof. So, so three things I'm going to introduce you to here. One's the natural numbers, that's what this little swiggly n means. So this is one, two, three, four, five, six, you know, you, you can guess the rest. There's an infinite number of them, of course, right? They keep going and going and going. So that, that's an infinite collection uh, of stuff that we're kind of used to. Uh, another infinite collection is the collection of fractions. So, so 1, 3 halves, 3.14, so forth and so on. Fraction numbers is another type of you know, infinite set of numbers that are going on. 
And one more type. It is the collection of all real numbers. So not just one and three halves and 3.14, but also things that are called irrational. The square root of two and pi, things that basically, if you write out their decimal expansions, they never repeat. They keep going random uh, as far as you want to go. And all these things are clearly containing an infinite number of elements. And what Cantor noticed, uh, back one, thank you. Well, oh, that was my fault, go ahead. So what Cantor noticed was that these two, the natural numbers and, and the fractional numbers, actually are the same infinite number of elements. Whereas the real numbers is a bigger infinite number of elements. You can make this very precise, but this bothered people a lot. Um, at, at the time. And so, so, so in other words, the, 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 the real numbers is a bigger infinity than the, the, the number of natural or rational numbers. And, oh, my historical notes were I mentioned before. Uh, so right, the, the guy who referred to him as the corrupt review was Kronecker. For my mathematicians in the audience, you'll recognize this name. Um, <clears throat> oh yeah, for, for, for those of us who are curious, uh, the type of infinity that the natural numbers is is called a countable infinity, hence counting, no? And the type of infinity that the real numbers are is called an uncountable infinity. And there are others that are out there uh, in case you wanted math to get more painful. Okay, that's great. Okay. Yeah, please. <coughs> ah, maybe one more little point to go back on. Uh, maybe, maybe one more little point. So, so you know, the, the, the story of Cantor really isn't unique in history. Unfortunately, there, there, there's a, a, a lot of examples like this. Uh, another nice one is if you go back to about 500 BC, there's a group of mathematical philosophers called Pythagoreans. So after the triangle guy, for those of you who remember your high school uh, trigonometry. And uh, among them was a guy called Hippopus, and he was supposedly the first guy to figure out that the square root of two was irrational, right? So it keeps repeating. And this really didn't sit well with them, and so they promptly drowned them. And, and you know, being 500 BC, there are a few different versions of the story, but they're all equally crazy. All right, so, so you know, again, these were you know, these were supposed to be philosophers. People have a hard time with these concepts sometimes. So, so. Math in one form or another is about writing equations which model how things work. So, so let me give you some, some examples. So there, there, there's temperature in the room, as we sort of discuss. There's how the water in the oceans move. There's, there's formation of behavior of black holes, how particles interact, so forth and so on. Um, there's practical considerations to when you write down these equations. So for instance, if you're trying to understand how the weather moves, clearly there's a practical reason to want to do this. Um, but but there's, there's also some, you know, let me give you at least maybe one interesting example of other reasons to want to actually write down equations that model things. Uh, this, this is an example from physics. So, so roughly speaking, modeling things can, can oftentimes introduce you not just a quantitative understanding of how something is you know, swiggling around, it can, it can introduce you to new types of behavior that you probably wouldn't have guessed existed in the first place. And a really nice example of this uh, um, comes from the 1920s. So, so, so a guy named Dirac, first wrote down an equation to try to model how the electron moved. So, so you, you probably have heard of electrons, and you've probably heard of positrons, right? So they, these are their antimatter counterparts, right? So, so this is a particle which you know, has the same mass as an electron. It's got the opposite charge. So they attract each other. And, and they have this really bizarre property that w when they collide, they interact and become pure energy. Right? So, so if you think about that for five minutes, this is a much weirder concept than different infinities or square root of two being irrational. This is a bizarre thing to come up with. So this was first found by Dirac from these equations meant to model the electron, just a set of math equations. I'm lying a little bit, but roughly speaking, what happened here was that he had this set of equations, and it had negative energy solutions, which were physically unreasonable. And he didn't like this, and he wanted to explain this. And the equations were good enough for him to not just sort of use this to guess that these negative energy solutions were supposed to correspond to the, the, this antimatter, but it was actually good enough for him to even predict how it should arise in an experiment. So, so looking at how these things appeared, he guessed what kind of experiment you should have to do to see that these things were real. Within about a year or two, someone did it, and they were real. Right? So, so I mean, well, one gets a lot of neat understanding by, by writing down how these things interact uh, over time. Um, OK, so what we're going to want to do is we're going to want to look at solutions of these equations, right, if you're a mathematician. 
and, and, and they could be, again, functions or shapes or more exotic objects. And, and the solutions are not going to always be nice. They're, they're going to have these singularities that, that I'm hoping to give a couple of examples of. And, and what we're going to see is there's two main questions we're going to want to ask about these singularities. Um, the, the, the first one's going to be, how big are the singularities? So in some sense, you know, if you're modeling something and if everything can be singular, then something's wrong. Right? You should expect singularities to not be everywhere. Not everything should be a black hole. Right? 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 Black holes occur at, at basically spatially at points, give or take, right? in space-time along lines, right? if they're consistent in time. Right? It shouldn't be everything. And the other thing we want to ask is, what's the structure of these singularities? It turns out to be kind of a miracle that in most cases, these things can't be random. When, when, when basically, when, when solutions of equations break, when, when you have something that's singular, they break nicely. And you can understand how they break. So, so, so we'll, we'll give a couple of examples if we're lucky. Uh, lucky meaning how I'm doing on time here. That's kind of like a page through 10 pages of notes. So we'll just stop after an hour and see what we do. Okay, okay great. So, 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 so let, let me list a, a, a couple of open problems uh, while we're at it. So, so, you know, there are a lot, actually. I mean, I would say a good chunk of problems from math, some, some good percentage of them are about singular things in one guise or another uh, that are floating around here. But let's name a few. So, so the first one I'll talk about here is a millennium problem. So this is one of these 70 million loopy questions. Um, and it's about the existence of regularities from called Navier stone. So, so, so let me tell you, Leon, in words, what, 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 what's being asked here. Uh, Navier-Stokes is, roughly speaking, the, the, the equation that models how fluids move around. Right? When you see all these nice little models of hurricanes swirling around or the ocean currents moving around, that's Navier-Stokes. Like some version of it or other floating around. And as you can sort of probably just even kind of imagine, right, in nice situations, things move around nicely. And if things get less and less nice, you start entering some turbulence, so things start getting more and more crazy. And really the question here is how crazy can it get? Um, and in particular, can these things break? Can you have solutions of these where you have actually infinities appearing? Can you have infinite speed? Can you have infinite pressure? Things like this occurring. This is not crazy, believe it or not. This happens in nature all the time. Again, it becomes down to the question of what type of infinity. How big is this infinity in the end? So, so the, the, the first question is whether or not you actually have nice solutions to the, the, how, how water moves in some sense. The, uh, the second question I'll try to talk about is mass gap and quantized DNA. So, so, so and then let me say this in, in English a little bit. Um, so, now the, these quantized Yang mills is a set of equations that, that were meant to govern uh, the behavior of subatomic, subatomic particles and how they interact. So, so they, they, they were in particular uh, designed to do the following. So, so you, you might have heard the following, give or take, right? So, you know, you have. Uh, lights, which you know, when you're first taking your classes, you treat as sort of being a wave, right? It's got different frequencies and it's coming at you. And then you've probably at least heard off and on to some extent or another that you can also view light as being a particle, right? So it can actually whack things uh, if you do the right kind of experiments. It turns out electrons do this too. Actually, all particles do this. They have both a wave and a particle sort of behavior. So called quantum field theory was about writing down equations that would actually correctly model this. That would give you know, I mean, it's. it's it's silly to have basically two sets of equations depending on two sets of behaviors. These should be consistent in one form or another, and this is what these did. As it turned out, these equations were so challenging that, that it basically took 20, basically because of infinities that, that, that occurred from self-interaction, which all the algebra <laughs> actually, um, that, that people couldn't solve them for a very, very long time. So after about 20 or so years, it was, it was, it was Feynman, uh, as well as say Dyson, Schwinger, and... Um, couple others, uh, um, who came up with this idea of basically solving it by not solving it. They solved something called the perturbative system, which basically means you approximate the solution near simple things. And this turned out to be marvelously successful. Uh, um, so, so if you're only interested in things like a couple particles coming in, interacting, and some more particles leaving, they got some nice answers. This doesn't at all explain what happens in complicated situations to this day. People still to this day can't solve this. And this doesn't all ex at all explain anything that you expect to not be so-called perturbative. So, so one of these sort of willful bad solutions. This problem, roughly speaking, is solve the equation. All right? Find how to actually solve the original thing and apply it to some of these questions that we know can't be answered without actually solving it. Right? So, so understand how particles interact by actually solving the system. And I see no chance of us getting there, but, but let me mention it in two words or, or less. 
right? The last thing I might talk about is I list for you a whole bunch of nonlinear geometric equations. I'm gonna list a whole bunch of big words here, don't worry about it, right? So so, so Ricci flow minimal surfaces, harmonic maps, Einstein manifolds, blah yaw manifolds, yang mills. Um, if we have time, we'll pick one of them, probably uh, minimal surfaces, because this is the easiest to connect to and have some sense of. And, and, and these are examples of some equations where we can understand what singularities look like, so, so they're, they're fun things to look at. Okay, so, good. So, so, we talked about infinity a little bit. Um, so, so now I want to talk about different, a different type of, of infinite size that's going on. I want to talk about infinities of sets and, and functions. Um, so, so this turns out to be much harder, much worse. I'm going to try to explain what these words mean and what I mean by infinities of sets and functions and give some examples and hopefully one actually singular example. So maybe this, this is going to be my, my, my doomed math page will be the next one. So, so let me start by actually giving some examples uh, of some non-singular things, some nice little things. Yep. So okay. So 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 let, let's start talking about the idea of dimension real quick. This is another way of measuring infinity when it comes to sets. Um. So some non-singular examples. So the the the, the first is a circle. Say it's one-dimensional. We can all picture this, right? So so you you've got this nice little one-dimensional object floating around here. Uh, uh, the second example that we kind of be used to would be uh, a sphere. So there we go. So this is like you know the surface of a basketball, or your countertop, or something, the surface of the earth, whatever. It's two dimensional, right? two dimensional one. The the next example would be like three dimensions. This is the, the space we live in. The example of that would be that if you include time, universe becomes a four dimensional object. Uh, unless you're talking to a string theorist, at which point it becomes a ten dimensional object, in fact. So, so the, the, by the way, these other six dimensions are so-called Calabi-Yau manifold. This is one of the things that, that, that I mentioned on the last slide. Um, and this is unless you're talking to a pim theorist, at which point it's at least 11 dimensional. Sure. <laughs> All right. So, example. So, so, so what are some singular examples? Um, let's look at least one construction uh, 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 of a singular set going on here. And this is, in fact, also due to, to, to Cantor originally. So, so this is where I'm going to become a math professor for, for, for one page. Okay, we're going to try to struggle through this. Okay, so, so the construction is going to be iterative uh, of this set. So, so okay, this is in pictures what the iteration is. I'm going to explain what this picture is. So what you're going to start with is an interval of length one. That's this top line here. So each new line is, is the next step of our construction. So, so the top line is, a, is an interval of length one. And what you're going to do then is you're going to take that interval of length one, and you're going to remove the middle third of it. And this is going to give you two intervals of length one third. And then you're going to do it one more time, and you're going to end up removing the middle third of each of these. They get four intervals of length one ninth, and you're going to keep doing this forever. Right? Every single time you take whatever's left, you're going to remove the middle one third of all of them. So you'll double the number of sort of intervals you have, and you'll one third the length of all of them. So note these are all sort of one-dimensional yeah. objects, right? I mean, you know, no, that's certainly one-dimensional. Those are all one-dimensional. But they're getting smaller and smaller and smaller as you keep doing this. So so in the limit here, so, so you not quite yet. Oh, oh, was that my goal? That was my goal. Um, so, so in the limit here, what you get is a, a, a nice set, which can't be one-dimensional anymore. Um, <clears throat> But it is a set, it is some subcollection. There is some collection of guys that survive this process in the end. It turns out they have some freaky dimension, log two over log three, in case you're curious. Right, so, so, so this is the example of a Cantor set. Um, so what we'll do maybe is show how this exists in nature real quick, just to get a sense of where these things might actually appear in life a little bit. Um, so, so a handful of examples. So, so the first examples are Saturn's rings, in fact. So, so uh, in this case, of course, I mean, you know, a slice of this is a Cantor set, so it's circles um, in this case. So, so the, the, this first image, not quite. So this first image here is actually a picture from the Cassini spacecraft. And uh, the, the second image here <coughs> is uh, a computer generation of, of a Cantor set that, that, that was uh, actually sort of precisely meant to, to, to model this. Um, Uh, I, I should mention that I, I stole uh, the, these images here from, from Lee and Sarveshti, who, who did this quite precisely. 
And <clears throat> in some sense, the fact that Saturn's rings are a cancer set isn't surprising. So, so where these things, these funky looking sets appear is they appear whenever resonance appears. So, so whenever, whenever you have a setup where, where, where you have different vibrations and they interact in, in a way to sort of build on each other, this is where cantor sets appear from in nature. So in this case, it's actually gravitational vibrations. So each of these rings has a, has a gravitational uh, a gra gravity associated to it. They're all interacting with each other and they're kind of vibrating off each other, you know, over millions of years. And what you end up with is a cantor set, which is called the Pali of Uh <clears throat> One nice other example is that it also uh, appears from X-ray diffraction. And this is coming from the so-called quantum Hall effect. And maybe just to sort of point out that you can do this in other ways. Instead of doing, taking one-dimensional objects, you can basically do this in a billion ways. For instance, you can take triangles and keep removing the, the, the middle chunk of them as you keep going. And this would be a two-dimensional cancer set. Uh, though it wouldn't be two-dimensional if like, you did its dimension, but it's also something funky. Okay. Um, if we survive that, I think we're pretty solid. Because that, 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 that's the worst that this actually gets. So this is our example of a single set. Um, let, let me give you an example now of a nicer singular set here, actually. This is so-called rectifiable set. Um, so, so these are basically, especially if you're a mathematician, these are nice singularities uh, as they occur. Uh, they tend to resemble that of broken glass in some sense. So, so what, what these basically look like, right, is a whole bunch of one-dimensional lines kind of glued together, right? No weird dimensions floating around here at this point. It's a whole bunch of one-dimensional things in there. Uh, they're sort of stuck in random ways, but such things are, are what we call rectifiable sets, give or take. Um, <clears throat> FYI, the second picture here was, was, I was looking for a picture that would basically just be drawing this, and what I found to best mimic this were some, uh, was an experiment done by NASA with spiders. So this is a spider web, and the, the second two spider webs are done with spiders who were uh, on marijuana and caffeine. And it turned out to look so nicely like what I was looking for, I decided to steal their image. <clears throat> so, so you know, one goal very often is, is that you, you want to distinguish between these and Cantor singularities that, that, that are occurring. <clears throat> so let's talk about some examples now and try to understand a couple of these equations. So, so Navier-Stokes. So, so and I sort of mentioned before, Navier-Stokes dictates the flow of an ideal fluid. Just for honesty, I'm going to do something mean here, right? I, I'm going to basically write German you for a minute. Uh, I'm going to tell you what the obvious equation actually looks like, just so we can be honest about it. And I'll even tell you kind of what each term does, right, even if we're not being precise about how you actually make this all work. So, so, and what's going to come, V is velocity, so, so imagine the following, you've you got some tub of water or a pond, and every point the water is moving, and it's moving in that direction with some speed, that's, you know, how it's moving, right, that, that's V, the velocity, and P is the pressure, and that, that, that's coming from this fluid. And here's the nasty looking equation that is not near Stokes, at least the, 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 the easiest version of it. So, so let me tell you what this means. Just, you know, why not? Um, we'll be quick. So this is telling you how the velocity is changing in time. Right? That's what the T little means. The, the, this term here is telling you the following interesting point. It's telling you that water moves in the direction of the velocity. So, so this should be, say, as opposed to how electric charges work. Right? If you have an electric charge, this also kind of has like a point in a direction and kind of how, how it's acting, but it's not pushing itself in the process, right? So this is something uniquely water that, that, that's occurring here. The, the, this here says that water doesn't compress, right? And it says that when you push the water in, it doesn't get, get denser. You, you can actually change that to make it so you can, but the easiest example is like that. And finally, this term here is called the fusion of the Laplace unit. It says the following, if I were to throw a stone into a pond, and the water waves occur, then you know, if you wait for a minute, they, they occur less and less and less, and they kind of diffuse out until nothing's happening. That's that term there. Right? So, so this is roughly not your stuff, right? So, so, you know, so there's 70 million ruples sitting in there, so it's not completely this time, right? Okay, so, so in simple so situations, these, these equations behave exactly as expected, right? So, got a nice little airfoil here, got a wing, da, 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 da. Air is moving around it nicely, as you would kind of expect it to do. The, the color here represents pressure, right? So the pressure is higher here and lower here, which is exactly how we get lift. The wings go up. Um, if we have water moving around a ball, then if it's at low speeds, it kind of just moves around and then keeps going. If it's at a higher speed, it starts to sort of actually pull apart. And now you get little spins, vortices that are occurring behind it. And this is a, 
can't see it very well, but this, this is a model of a hurricane ne next to Florida. Uh, this was an actual hurricane they were modeling at the time, but I forget which one. It's a big deal in Florida. Um, <clears throat> and uh, um, so, so as you can probably imagine, a more complicated situation, you're going to experience turbulence, kind of like what, what's, what's happening kind of inside this hurricane. But it can get worse and worse and worse, right? You can start talking about the fluid moving inside the sun, which is getting more and more dramatic. You can talk about a whole bunch of uh, dramatic actions. And the question is, how bad can it actually get in really <coughs> complicated situations? And can these things actually form singularities? Can, can velocity become infinity? Can, can pressure become infinity? This is unknown. Right? And it's not to say it's even a ridiculous idea that, that it would be true. Um, it would either mean the equations are dumb, or it would mean there's a new phenomenon going on here that, that that's in very rigid situations that you'd want to understand. Right? So, so the, the, the problem here is find that out. Find out these things can form singularities. And, uh, you know, if they're all, by the way, most money at this point is that they do form singularities. Um, this seems to be how they're, they're, they're heading. They seem to be fairly close to actually getting an example. Uh, showing singularities in form, at which point the question then becomes um, how big? How big are these singularities? What do they look like? What's their behavior? These are the interesting questions that come next. Okay. Hey, we made it all the way to the, 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 the math. Yeah, fantastic. Fine, I'm placing my notes. Okay. So, Quantizing mill. So, so as I mentioned very briefly before, so so no nice pictures this time. I'm just going to explain kind of an interesting story. Um, quantizing mills dictates the behavior of subatomic particles. It, it tells you how electrons interact. I'm lying a little bit. There's other equations involved, but that's okay. It tells you how electrons interact. It tells you how different types of particles interact. How, how protons and neutrons interact. Uh, protons, by the way, aren't really particles, right? They are they are fundamental particles. They're made up of smaller things. This is not true of electrons, right? This is one way they're quite different. <clears throat> and so, 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 oops. I really didn't have to check my stops very carefully, did I? So, so, well, unfortunately, possibly go back one. No, it's not. Unfortunately, um, these equations that I mentioned before aren't meaningful. Seems to be Um People don't know how to actually solve them in the end. Uh, so, so, this, you know, let me give you an abbreviated and not entirely fair history of how this works. So, so sometime in the late 1920s is when Dirac wrote these things down in the first place. Uh, that this is very much related to the electron-positron story that, that I mentioned at the beginning. Um, basically, it wasn't those equations, but it, it's what's called the, the, the field quantization of those equations is what occurred. And it was recognized early on that these equations were not solvable. Uh, if I have my history correct here, I believe the first person who recognized this, or certainly the first person who I think gave it sort of a fair amount of study was Oppenheimer, so this was the atomic bomb guy. But what he basically recognized is that inside these equations, you know, if you have like an electron, the electron was actually able to interact with itself. And this was a major problem. The, the electron would interact with itself, and basically it would interact more and more and more and more until there was an infinity that occurred. And, and this, this turned out to be a pretty major problem for decades. Um, so, so basically into the early 1950s. And, and finally, it was solved by, by Beth Feynman, Schwinger, Dyson, and Tomonaga. They, they got Nobel prizes with this after. So, so, so these quantum field theories, the, 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 the million dollar problem, or the 70 million dollar problem, it, it, it is, is to solve them non perturbatively and to use these solutions to address uh, some of these issues that, that are actually appearing. You know, there's a huge amount of work going into related things right now. Okay, great. So, yeah, I might actually end 10 minutes early. Um, lectures like this, by the way, really hard for mathematicians. <laughs> um, so, so my sense of timing of this is probably a little off. So, so, so what I'm going to uh, talk to you about is the minimal surface equation. So, so this is h equals zero. h is the mean curvature of your mathematician. Uh, otherwise, don't worry about what it means. Basically, it means that these are surfaces where, where all the tension kind of balances out in the end. Everything, so all the forces acting and how they want to pull themselves all balance out so you get something stable. So, so, so the easiest example of this going down to the 1800s, which, which is, you know, why, why one can have nice pictures that get a first understanding of this, is so basically. 
So, so here's some examples, right? So, so you've got yourself some, some, some nice, honest kind of soap bubbles that are actually occurring. And you have yourself some solutions of, of this nonlinear equation. So that this, this is what I meant about solutions being shapes. Right? So, so that this is a natural solution of some, some math equation, both of these. You can see quite clearly it's, it's pretty darn accurate. Um, <clears throat> Um, so so, uh, it, 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 so, so these, these sorts of two-dimensional minimal surfaces have been studied since the 1800s. They're really clean looking. None of them have singularities. They're all very nice. Uh, also, maybe I mentioned that, that, that these sort of minimal surfaces here also appear in the study of black holes. Um, they, they play the form of a so-called trap surface there. They're, it's used to prove certain mathematical inequalities about how black holes have to act, so-called Penrose inequalities. Um, so... <coughs> What happens, though, is if we go into higher dimensions, uh, something sort of starts to break down. So, so we can talk about minimal surfaces in more than just two dimensions. They can be in much higher dimensions. If this sounds weird, remember a string theory says the universe being 10-dimensional, so why not? Uh, um, this actually occurs all over the place in math, these sort of higher dimensional minimal surfaces. But, but they occur for much the same reason they kind of occur there. You have these sort of slices of things, and the, the forces are supposed to balance out on them, and the slices don't need to be two-dimensional at all. So what? Uh, um, it turns out that starting in dimension seven, uh, these minimal surfaces actually begin to form singularities. So, so in dimension seven, uh, they have point singularities, and in dimension eight, they have line singularities, and so forth and so on. So they start to get nastier and nastier. And the, the, the first example of this was, was actually discovered by, by Jim Simons. Uh, it's probably worth pointing out that this is the same Jim Simons who's the uh, billionaire of Wall Street investor now, so I think he's the, the 20th richest man in America at the moment. Uh, this is probably your one and only example of a mathematician doing something practical. <laughs> <laughs> Although I, I suppose one could argue that analyzing Wall Street is just as abstract as most of this, but there's certainly a more practical outcome that comes from it. <clears throat> so, so one thing you can say, right, so, so these singularities for these minimal surfaces are not understood. This is a big open problem, what they look like. You can say they're nice. You can say these cantor sets don't appear for them. You can say they, they, they have to have only rectifiable things. So these, you know, integer dimension things that aren't looking really crazy with these weird holes that, that are appearing everywhere, that they're unions of things like that that are not so, so awful looking. 